city. So we've got dense cities and we've got lots of people living in those cities. What's the big deal? Well, let's examine the big deal. Although it's been 20 years since NASA climate scientists first announced they had picked up the signal of global warming, some deniers still insist it's not happening. In many cases, it's because of long, out-of-date notions of what the science is really saying. One of the most popular that I heard from a high school student recently is illustrated in this clip from a bogus climate denial film that gets a lot of circulation on the internet. It goes like this. Forests have been felled to make way for residential areas and shopping malls. Fields replaced by office blocks in stone and concrete. And the space between the buildings has been paved over to become motorways and parking lots. The switch from countryside to city has changed the local climate. Modern man sweats from the urban heat island effect. Now, it is true that the climate of those cities has warmed, but not because of greenhouse gases increasing, but because of the change in the uh, surroundings and the uh, building of structures. Is that true? Could the scientists at NASA, the National Academy of Science, the American Meteorological Society, and every professional scientific organization on the planet really have been so silly as to miss something this obvious? Of course not. They've compensated for that factor. But let's look at it a different way. Many of you have seen this picture. It's a satellite image of the Earth at night with all the lights of the city showing up. We're going to use this to show something. But first, I have to do a little transformation. Let's make the light dots into dark spots. Are you with me? Same map, just inverted it to make something easier to see. All those dots represent city lights. This map would be a pretty good indicator of where we'd expect the urban heat island effect to show up, don't you think? Now let's look at another map. This is the Global Temperatures Anomaly map from NASA for 2008. It shows which parts of the globe are warming the fastest. The darker the red, the more that area has been warming in the past several decades. Do you see where I'm going with this? Of course you do. Let's put the temperature map over the map of city lights. Notice anything? The urban areas don't really correspond with the red warming zones. Doesn't that seem strange if these urban areas are supposed to be the places where thermometers are distorted? Why do denialists persist in repeating something that is so easily proven wrong? In some cases, ignorance. In some cases, laziness. In some cases, they simply don't care if they're right or wrong, as long as they create confusion and paralysis. Remember, for the fossil fuels companies, every delay in action is money in the bank. But some denialists persist in the notion that evil scientists all over the world are deliberately distorting the temperature data to fool you about global climate. It's all part of a sinister plot. I have an idea. Instead of arguing about whose temperature data is right, let's just throw it all out. That's right, throw out all the temperature data. Let's look at the world with fresh eyes, as if we're aborigines with technological tools. No thermometers to tell us what's going on, just the real responses of the real planet. Turns out that someone's done this. In a paper by NASA scientists published in the journal Nature, observations were made of the timing of nature's most basic processes. The migration of birds. The blooming of flowers. The spawning of fish. The peak flows of glacial streams in springtime. Flowers, streams, and birds don't have an agenda. They don't know about politics. They just respond. And they tell us about what their environment is doing because this study of 29,500 sets of physical and biological data found that at a global scale, 90% of the observed changes were in the direction of warming. Here's another example. These are pictures from space of lakes on the frozen tundra of Siberia. The first one was taken in 1973. 
Notice the large round lake in the upper right. Now see what's changed in a photo taken in 2002. The ground has become warmer, softer, and the lake water is seeping down into the spongy ground that formerly was frozen permafrost. It's changing the face of Siberia and delivering even more heat to deeper levels where huge stores of carbon and methane have been frozen for many millennia. Lakes don't lie. Birds, fish, and flowers aren't liberal or conservative. They merely respond. And the story that they're telling us is the same one that every leading scientific organization on the planet has now been telling us for decades. Climate change is real. We're doing it. The consequences are dire. And we need to stop. The points that you need to keep in mind when you design a sustainable habitat is the larger context of what we are dealing with. And a lot of these issues are small, small things that happen at a local level but contribute to the global context. What is the global context? Number one, climate change and temperature rise. We are all aware that the temperature is rising. This is, it's anthropogenic. There's enough evidence over here. Please go ahead and read the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's reports. The UNFCCC has been preparing those for a long time and uh, Russia, or at least come abreast with what is what are the findings of the IPCC, how is it that they have discovered what they have discovered. It is important for all of us to know that what we are dealing with is happening at the global level, but we can make a difference at the local level. If you want to look at changes in the system that are significant, that might be associated with actual global warming, you have to measure above that natural ability, so you need a long record. The series instruments and their predecessors have been taking the Earth's temperature for almost 30 years, and this data can be used in conjunction with other measurements of the Earth's vital signs. One of NASA's most important tools for measuring that heat is an instrument on board the Aqua, Terra, Trim, and NPP satellites called Ceres, Clouds and the Earth's Radiant Energy System. The second aspect that we need to keep in mind is the aspect of radiative forcing. Now it was around the year 2009-2010, I don't recollect exactly what IPCC report that was, that they spoke about radiative forcing. What is radiative forcing? The fact that all the pollutants that we have in the atmosphere, ordinarily when the sun's radiation comes and strikes the surface of the earth, some bit of it is absorbed by the black parts of the earth, which you would know are the depths of the ocean. All the deep oceans look like they are black. If you look at satellite images, they look like they are black parts, right? Those are the parts that absorb solar radiation. Then we've got the ice caps, we've got the Himalayas, we've got the Alps, and of course we've got the polar caps that reflect solar radiation. Then we've got the deserts, which are in the neutral range, but still reflect, but due to the mass of sand, they absorb heat of the desert, of the sun. And then we've got the jungles, which are the neutral, uh, part that absorb, but absorb solar radiation to convert that into rich oxygen, into uh, moisture, into water vapor that then balances the temperature of the earth. Over the past many years now, four or five decades, we have started disrupting this balance. Now the first term that I'd like you to learn is the term called albedo. The earth also has albedo. Albedo, very similar to um, uh, the, the, the word albino. Right? Where you know the people who have uh, leucoderma, who have very light skin color. Right? So albedo is a measure of whiteness. How white is the surface? How light is the surface? Now Earth has a very delicate balance of albedo, where some bit, like I said, is absorbed, some bit is reflected, and this is just the right balance that maintains the temperature of the Earth. Over the past few years, by recklessly building buildings, by recklessly building transport corridors and roads, by adding to the automobiles that are on the roads in our countries and across the world, we have disrupted this very delicate albedo and it's tipping towards increasing the temperature. How does that happen? The solar radiation that comes to the earth is trapped within the atmosphere of the earth due to radiative forcing. And that time, I'm saying 2010, 2009, the IPCC reports had predicted that if we stop all formats of emissions on the planet, it would take 100 years for the pollutants that are already in our atmosphere to be dissipated. 100 years, ladies and gentlemen, we still have not stopped. So the onus is up to you how we can prevent images like this, sea level rise. We've all seen small island nations are screaming themselves hoarse. They seek help.
help they seek support from us how we can reduce our emissions so that their islands don't increasingly go under by the number we don't want atlantis is repeated over and over again right then of course we've got climate extremes we have extreme weather events that are happening all over the world we've got urban heat islands now remember possibility with built up cities right it's urban heat islands we are all aware that urban heat islands are a function of the number of built up areas and buildings that we have in a the city they absorb solar radiation they absorb the heat of the sun and they slowly give it out into the uh, towards you know directed towards the night sky so during the day the city which has high built up area will have higher temperatures as compared to the surrounding areas even at night when the night sky is absorbing all the radiation of the of the earth the earth is dissipating its radiation towards the night sky the buildings are still emitting heat so you will always experience cities as a few degrees higher uh, than the surrounding peri urban or rural areas right and then of course we've got aspects like air conditioning so the air conditioners are giving heat out into the atmosphere then we've got automobiles they're giving heat out into the atmosphere then we've got roads that are absorbing heat and radiating that back into the atmosphere you put all this together and you've got urban heat islands right all that onus comes on to us and believe me it does not come as a function of just adding more air conditioning to the building it comes as a very very delicate balance of the right architectural interventions the right passive design interventions with a combination of the least amount of possible air conditioning that we can provide comfort with to create a sustainable habitat so all these things we need to keep in mind and bear in mind as the larger context of every action that we take to design a sustainable habitat